so welcome to this next lecture having gone through the simple room environment control example uh, we are now ready to talk about the issues that get addressed in chemical process control to begin with let's look at a very simple chemical process you have fresh a cold fresh a feed getting preheated in a feed effluent heat exchanger where the cold fresh feed stream exchanges heat with the hot reactor effluent stream so the reactor effluent stream cools down the cold feed heats up this preheated feed is then sent to a heater which is driven by a steam heater which is driven by steam as the utility heating fluid so the cold feed is heated to the reactor temperature and the mildly exothermic reaction A goes to B occurs in this CSTR. The reaction heat is removed in the cooling jacket which has a cooling which has a coolant flowing through it. The reactor conversion is not complete so maybe 30, 40, 50 percent single pass conversion. So the reactor effluent is a mixture of unreacted A and whatever B gets formed. This hot reactor effluent loses heat to the cold feed in the feed effluent heat exchanger and the cooled reactor effluent is then sent to a distillation column and let's assume that B is heavier than A so in the distillation column heavy B leaves down the bottoms uh, nearly pure A leaves up the top and this nearly pure A is recycled back to the reactor along with the fresh feed. So this simple process highlights two unique features that you will come across almost every continuous process and these two unique features are material recycle and process to process energy recycle and it is recycle that brings richness to chemical engineering as a profession in fact I would go to the extent of saying if there was no recycle there would be no chemical engineering what does material recycle do well if you look at the entire plant the envelope ar around the entire plant and see what's coming and going out of the plant what you have is the plant takes in A that's going in and only B the product stream leaves the plant and if we assume that the product stream is pure all of the A that enters the plant leaves as B. So in other words with respect to the entire plant the utilization efficiency of A to B is 100%. Every mole of A that enters the process gets converted to B and leaves the process. This 100% raw material utilization efficiency is due to recycle even as the single pass reactor conversion may be 30, 40, 50 percent yet the overall A to B conversion efficiency of the process with material recycle is 100 percent. So this minimizes the raw material A consumed per kg B produced. Similarly when you have energy recycle here the stream to be heated to the reactor temperature is now hotter because it has been preheated in the feed effluent heat exchanger and therefore this heater is smaller also it uses less steam the utility consumption rate is lower so the amount of steam consumed per kg fresh A feed processed or per kg B produced reduces because of energy recycle. Of course this reduction comes at the cost of an extra feed effluent heat exchanger but please note if you did not have a feed effluent heat exchanger A this heater would be larger B you would have to have a separate cooler to cool the hot reactor effluent to the temperature at which it must go into the column. Yeah, So all in all the energy exchange is giving you 
energy efficiency benefit you are consuming less energy from outside you are having to consume less energy per kg feed processed you are having to buy less steam per kg fresh a processed so this is the benefit of material and energy recycle which is also known as uh, process integration so process integration minimizes a consumed per kg b produced that is it maximizes the raw material utilization efficiency it also minimizes the steam consumed per kg b product and of course because of this you get higher process profitability the profitability is good but then you see everything is connected to everything else and this connection of everything to everything else something happens here that disturbance propagates to this guy that disturbance propagates here and here and then it comes back you see a local disturbance because of these interconnections and recycles can propagate across the entire plant so the dynamic control of such processes becomes very challenging due to recycle because recycle creates a pathway creates an interaction that is two way it's not that you disturb this guy that guy disturbs that guy that guy disturbs that guy no 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 this guy then disturbs you back and so because of this two way interaction you get very interesting dynamics you get non linearity etc etc and which is why chemical engineering is such a great discipline so yes material and energy recycle makes economic sense but it creates dynamic control challenges which must be addressed by the control system designer we'll talk more about what are these challenges so here we have a non linear process with potentially severe dynamic interaction between the various units due to material and energy recycle and such a process must be operated in a safe stable manner and it should also make sufficient profit because that's why the plant is there so that, so that the company that has invested the money makes money for its shareholders by selling value added products and these economic objectives are typically reflected in terms of production rate how much to be produced depending on market demand the quality that you're guaranteeing to the customer effluent specifications carbon credit these days and so on so forth so these objectives of safety stability and economics must be met 24/7 all the time and this must be achieved even as the production objective itself can change and there are ever present disturbances we saw disturbances in the room example you know q solar q wall q leaks and so on and so forth n number of people walking into a room these are all disturbances what are the typical process disturbances that a plant faces typically you got ambient conditions that are changing so for example the cooling water tower performance will drop dramatically if there is rain and the air becomes humid humid air because humid air is not dry it cannot soak in more water it doesn't have the capacity to soak in evaporate more water and therefore the cooling effect because of evaporation is not as effective and therefore a cooling tower that is cooling the hot water received from all the plants the cooling water may be at 35 degrees celsius on a rainy day whereas on a dry summer day the cooling water may be available at 20 degrees celsius so ambient conditions change raw material quality today your refinery is supposed to process very nice sweet crude from saudi arabia tomorrow you are supposed to process uh, lousy sour crude from i don't know nigeria or maybe venezuela yeah then sensors are not always exact they've got biases they've got noise equipment characteristics change today you've got a fresh brand new sparkling clean uh, furnace 6 months of operation and now the tubes in the furnace are all blacked out because of burning and coking and things like that brand new catalyst 6 months later it's deactivated because of sintering coking 
catalyst poisons brand new heat exchanger six months later fouled up so the equipment characteristics change slowly but surely and even though all these things are happening together all the time ambient conditions raw material quality sensor sensor noise sensor biases degradation of equipment characteristics you still want to operate the process safely stably and economically how is this done using a control system why do we need a control system and specifically in chemical processes it's because you want safe stable and economic operation safety and stability is ensured if you can operate the process at steady state any chemical engineering course what do you do you write the material balance you write the energy balance and you say okay let's assume that it's a steady state so the rate of accumulation is zero and then you get a bunch of algebraic equations that are to be solved simultaneously you solve them and you get the steady state solution that's what we do in chemical engineering material energy balancing courses heat transfer courses uh, mass transfer courses and so on and so forth so the point is steady state guarantees safety and stability what do we mean by steady state what we mean is at steady state the accumulation accumulation rate of a material or energy or of a species must be zero and accumulation rate is nothing but rate in minus rate out plus generation rate for steady state what we must have is that this accumulation rate must get driven to zero does this accumulation get rate get driven to zero by itself usually no and because it is usually no what that means is the right hand side is either slightly positive or slightly negative and if it remains slightly positive that means material or energy inventory is building up in that unit or plant energy inventory building up in a unit or plant typically means that the temperature is increasing or the pressure is increasing and ultimately you'll reach an unsafe condition where for example a rupture disk may blow up and so on and so forth material inventory building means for example level in a liquid tank is building up building up building up and the tank uh, overflows yeah so if the right hand side of this equation is slightly positive or slightly negative then that means that particular inventory is either building up or depleting in that unit or in the plant and ultimately you are going to hit a safety constraint in order to drive it to zero to drive the accumulation rate of that particular inventory to zero what do you need to do you need to adjust one of the terms on the right hand side and rule of thumb is whichever one term is the largest adjust that one because that gives you muscle uh, that gives you a large stick to drive a deviating bull back onto the track yeah so why do you need a control system you need a control system to drive the accumulation of all independent inventories in a plant to zero some of the inventories may be self regulatory that means self regulatory means uh, the accumulation rate because of the behavior of the right hand side terms automatically gets driven to zero a very common example would be for example if you have a tank and uh, flow by gravity down the tank and let us say you've got flow in at steady state this flow and this flow must be zero let us say this flow is increased if this flow is increased the level will increase to such an extent such that at that increased level the outflow will increase so the level will increase to the extent necessary such that the outflow balances the inflow and that's your new steady state so this is a self the level in a tank flow by gravity example is self regulatory it regulates itself it reaches a new steady state there are other examples we'll talk about them so there are self regulatory inventories in a process that regulate by themselves so you may not need a controller there but most inventories are non self regulatory in nature and therefore you need to make a control in intervention and adjust one of the terms rate in rate out or generation rate such that the right hand side of the material energy or component balance gets driven to zero once it gets driven to zero you get steady state if you get steady state safety and stability is guaranteed 
So why do you need a control system? You need a control system to drive the accumulation of all independent inventories to zero for steady operation. So a regulatory control system, its primary purpose is stabilization of the process around a steady state or at a steady state. This stabilization happens by driving the inventory accumulation terms to zero, ensuring steady state plant operation. So once you have a plant that can operate at steady state, now you put in the next level of complexity. Okay, guaranteed that this plant is going to be stable, inventories are not going to blow up or deplete, the accumulation terms are going to be zero. Now the next question is what should these inventory levels be? So for example, reactor temperature is a reflection of the amount of energy inventory in the reactor. So what temperature should I operate this? So you got a temperature controller that's manipulating, for example, let us say the reactor cooling duty. So this temperature controller is closing the energy balance on the reactor. Now the question is, what should be the temperature set point value such that, for example, the yield to the desired product is maximized? selectivity of the desirable reaction is maximized. Then you start asking these kinds of questions. So once you are guaranteed that the regulatory control system will drive the process to steady state, the next question that you ask is what steady state to operate at? And this steady state is determined by the set points of your regulatory controllers, level controllers, temperature controllers, pressure controllers, level being a reflection of liquid inventory, temperature being a reflection of energy inventory, pressure being a reflection of gas inventory or in vaporized systems latent heat inventory. So if you are vaporizing more, more amount of latent heat is stored in the process even though the temperature remains the fix, temperature remains the same. So what steady state to operate at is governed by economic considerations. And so you may want to adjust the available regulatory set points to minimize, for example, steam consumed per kg product to minimize the expensive utility comp consumption or to minimize the refrigeration duty of a cryogenic distillation column or to maximize production because it's a seller's market. Whatever I sell, there is infinite demand. I can, I'm a monopoly, whatever I sell, there's a buyer desperately waiting for it. So if I maximize production, I maximize revenue and I maximize my profit and so on and so forth. So this is like, so there's two aspects to the problem. Imagine a bicyclist. Eh? Well, this is a lousy bicycle, but it is a bicycle. Yeah. So imagine a bicycle and there's a chap who's riding the bicycle. Yeah. So with respect, with respect to this riding of bicycle, there are two issues that need to be addressed. The first one is the rider must be able to stabilize the bicycle so that it doesn't fall. Once you stabilize the bicycle, now you can start asking the next level of question, which is how should I ride my bicycle so that I get from point A to point B in, for example, the least amount of time. So how should I, what is my optimal riding policy for the bicycle? So the stabilization is regulation and the riding policy, the route that I must take so that I get from point A to point B in the least amount of time that would be equivalent to uh, economic optimization. What should be my set point so that my process makes most amount of money or consumes the least amount of utility or my operating cost is minimized and so on and so forth. So any plant wide control system for a real plant with material and energy recycle loops will have a control system that is hierarchical in nature. At the base you have the regulatory control layer which is over here. And then you've got supervisory and optimization layers on top. The regulatory control layer adjusts flow in, flow out terms. And these adjustments are made so that inventory balances, material and energy balances on each of the individual op unit operations as well as the overall plant balances are closed. The closure of these independent material and energy balances ensures that the plant 
operation gets driven to steady state and then on top of the regulatory layer you've got an economic layer and what this economic layer determines is what is the optimum steady state and corresponding to this optimum steady state what are the set points of the regulatory layer so these set points come from the economic layer down to the regulatory layer and then these economic set points get implemented in the regulatory layer and by implementing the economic optimum set points in the regulatory layer the process operation gets driven close to the optimum steady state to the extent possible so this is how plant wide control is actually done in a hierarchical layered fashion and hopefully by the end of this course you should be able to design robust plant wide control systems for complete plants with material and energy recycle loops so to summarize chemical process control systems for continuous processes which are by far the norm why do we need a control system it's required for stabilization safety and stability that is steady operation as well as well as for ensuring economic optimality or near economic optimality so that the plant makes the maximum possible profit that's the reason why you need a control system what to control well first of all the independent inventories and next key indicators that determine economic operation so for example some set points that are constrained they should be either at their max or min limit unconstrained set points should be adjusted so that their unconstrained optimum is well tracked this is not a trivial problem and uh, even for that simple running example we talk about talked about a marathon run versus a 100 meter sprint you could see that there's a lot of thinking and process insight that goes into deciding what constitutes a process variable which when controlled gives near optimum operation once you know what to control the next issue is what to manipulate and unlike uh, mechanical and aerospace systems in chemical processes there are many 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 options and just to give you an example here is a tank so flow in flow out you could have inflow under flow control material balance is closed by this level control this is one option or you could have an alternative option where the outflow stream is under flow control and level is controlled in this way both of these control systems are ensuring closure of the material balance on the liquid tank which one to implement why so this is just two options if you have more number of valves if you have more number of units interconnections the number of options actually multiply combinatorially which ones make sense which one do not which ones do not make sense you know that also requires some level of understanding <coughs> and then once you know what to control and what to manipulate the quantitative algorithms that shall be used for manipulation and we just talked about a few on off control p pi pid control and you can see that the top 3 chaps answering these questions requires process understanding you must understand your process well before you can control it the quantitative algorithms and their tuning for good control good dynamic control that is the remit of control theory we are going to cover both aspects process understanding and control theory in sufficient detail so that you get comfortable with designing effective control systems for entire integrated chemical plants so that's our course outline in 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 short we going to do control theory which is material that is available in all textbooks we going to also do control structure synthesis what to control and why what to manipulate and why this material is much more obscure and it is not available in textbooks so i would strongly encourage that you go through the lectures carefully and not miss lectures because the material 
that I'm going to give out with respect to designing control systems for the for entire plants, entire integrated plants with material and energy recycle is not available in textbooks. Okay. So this course shall cover both aspects in sufficient detail. Uh, I'm just going to give you an example cumin process. So cumin is produced by the reaction of addition of propylene, Friedel Crafts alkylation of benzene with propylene over acid catalyst. This will give you cumin which is C9. So cumin is like this, you know, benzene plus uh, propylene. Uh, this is propylene. One, two, three. Yeah, this is propylene. gives uh, cumin. Of course, a side reaction also occurs. The propylene adds to the benzene to the cumin. Another molecule of propylene adds to cumin. And I don't know if it adds to the ortho position, meta position or, or, or the para position. Maybe it does to all three. But basically what you get is. And uh, let's just say you get this is called diisopropyl benzene. So you've got two reactions. The main reaction is C6 plus C3 giving C9 cumin and then C9 adding further with C3 to give C12. This is desirable. This is undesirable. For every molecule of C12 that you produce, you are wasting two molecules of C3 and one molecule of benzene. Yeah. So Clearly, given this reaction chemistry, you know that, okay, the reactor should be operated in excess benzene environment, excess C6 environment, so that C3 is the limiting reactant. If C3 is the limiting reactant, the rate of reaction of the undesirable reaction will be suppressed. And so you will, you will improve the yield of the process. You will maximize the yield of the process to C9 and minimize uh, wastage to C12. Yeah. So the process is like this. You get fresh benzene mixing with recycled benzene, propylene and propylene has some propane in it, inert propane in it. These are preheated and then vaporized and heated to the reaction temperature in a furnace. So the vapor stream goes to goes to a packed bed reactor and the packed bed reactor is essentially is cooled because the reaction is highly exothermic it's a very highly exothermic uh, system so the tubes contain the catalyst and the reaction mixture flows through the tubes because of the release of heat due to reaction the tubes are very hot uh, what you have is uh, pressurized hot water circulating on the shell side at a very high rate because the circulation rate is very high, uh, the temperature rise of the pressurized water is, is is very small. But then this pressurized water goes to a flash drum. The pressure in the flash drum is lower than the pressurized reactor pressure and therefore the pressurized water flashes, Vape steam gets generated. So the reaction heat, heat gets removed as steam and whatever water gets lost as steam uh, it is made up by adding fresh boiler feed water to the boiler. So the reaction heat is being removed as steam. The hot reactor effluent is cooled and you cool it sufficiently so that everything condenses. And the liquid is then sent to a stabilizer column. The stabilizer column removes uh, the C3 as fuel gas. Any unreacted propylene and the propane that is coming with the propane stream is removed as is vented as vapor distillate from the stabilizer column. Uh, C6, C9 and C12 leave down the bottoms.
and this then go to another column which is called the recycle column and in this recycle column uh, the C6 is recovered up the top C9 and C12 go down the bottoms the C9 and C12 go to the product column where C9 is recovered up the top and C12 leaves down the bottoms so this is the process very simple process actually in reality what happens is this di diisopropyl benzene is then oh sorry the diisopropyl benzene is then taken to a uh, mixed with some more benzene heated and then put through a trans alkylator a trans alkylator reactor which is adiabatic and what happens in the trans alkylator is uh, C12 plus C6 on a trans alkylation catalyst gives two molecules of uh, C9 cumin so the C12 is converted to C9 it's actually an equilibrium reaction and so the reactor effluent contains C unreacted C12 uh, C6 and C9 and this is then recycled to the recycle column somewhere here yeah so the process then does not waste any of the benzene and the propylene as diisopropyl benzene the diisopropyl benzene is uh, so called recycled to extinction so this is the process hopefully by the end of this course you will be able to design effective control systems for uh, these kinds of processes so that's the idea and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the course thank you for your attention hope to see you again next time